On this day, 10 years ago, the 18th of November 2013, NASA launched the MAVEN spacecraft, MAVEN being an acronym for Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution, and its aim was to orbit Mars and study its atmosphere to learn why Mars be that way. What happened to its atmosphere that turned it from a planet that could support life to the icy, barren world that it is today? So far, the mission has learned a lot, but I think it could do a lot better. And I say that totally seriously. I believe that if NASA had come to me in 2013, then I could have designed a much better spacecraft to analyze Mars's atmosphere. And since NASA is simply too arrogant to ever ask me to teach them, I will instead just show them with this video. I will recreate the MAVEN spacecraft in Kerbal Space Program, that being a satellite with engines, communications dish, solar panels, science equipment, all nicely packaged in a 2.3 by 2.3 by 2.3 meter box, well, actually 2.5 meter in KSP because that's the closest size square panel piece that we have. And I'll learn a heck of a lot more about Juno's atmosphere, the in-game version of Mars, than NASA ever could with their quite frankly pathetic MAVEN spacecraft. Here you can see that construction is well underway and by now you've probably figured out one of the many ways in which my mission is superior to the MAVEN. We're not only sending an astronaut to Mars, but he's actually in a separate spacecraft that can undock from the main ship and perform a surface landing where he can then deploy an atmospheric weather station on the ground and while we're at it a whole host of other scientific equipment. Then he can re-embark the lander, lift off from the surface and redock with the MAVEN mothership, after which the entire spacecraft will depart Duna, having obtained all data needed in far less time than the 9 plus years that MAVEN has been sat at Mars for, because my craft is superior in every way and then return safely to Earth, bringing back hard data for scientists to analyze. And here in the construction time lapse, you can see me starting to add some of the scientific instrumentation. Of course, this is only on the orbital part of the spacecraft. The surface lander has its own array of scientific instruments. Again, meaning that we're gonna net a huge amount of science points, far more science points than the Maven ever could have gathered. And now that we've painted it, it's nice gold foil color. We're just gonna add a quick probe core, an SAS unit, a battery, and a little light for a little bit of extra visual flair, the spacecraft is now complete. And with the spacecraft's construction complete, we can get to building the launcher, which is a recreation of the Atlas V. It's, it's very hard to do an accurate Atlas V with stock Kerbal Space Program parts, but I think I did a pretty good job. We first off have the, what I think is a fairly close recreation to the fairing used for the Maven launch. Then we can build the Centaur upper stage, which is going to circularize our orbit around Kerbin and also put us on a trajectory towards Mars. And then we can build the iconic Atlas V lower stage with no solid rocket boosters needed, just the single core with those twin engines at the bottom. They are the RS-25 equivalent engine, so not the same as what was on the Atlas V, but I gotta work with what I've got to work with here. <laughs> but construction is now complete, so now we just gotta wait. Wait for what, I hear you ask? Well, of course, we have to wait for a Juno transfer window. I like to use the little lens flare from the sun to line things up. So we have Kerbin along the flat line of the lens flare. Take a look at Juno. If you were to draw a line from Juno to the sun, the angle that line forms with our flat base should be 45 degrees, with of course Juno being ahead of Kerbin. So with that out of the way, let's launch our Atlas V. And there we are, ain't it a beautiful sight? I mean, I say that Kerbal Space Program 2 has somewhat spoiled me a little bit when it comes to the launch aesthetics and sound design. That game has its flaws, but uh, the visual flair of the launches is not one of those flaws. But hey, look at that. We have Black Rack's amazing stock volumetric clouds mod installed as we soar through the atmosphere. And I want to draw attention to the fact that actually, because this mission, the Maven I mean, was launched on an Atlas V, it makes even more sense really that we bring an astronaut with us. I mean, think about it. While not human or space frog certified, 
It almost was, if Starliner had been brought to operation in time. So why not just stick an astronaut in the Maven? It's launching on a crew rated rocket basically anyway. And even though it's not technically human certified, the Atlas V is one of the most reliable rockets of all time. I mean, that's a rocket that you bet your life on. Jebediah, I'm sure, is very comfortable in his capsule here. I've given him snacks and not just Tesco Value brand either. I've given him the proper nice branded stuff. And he's got an iPad mini with seven movies that I meticulously burned off DVD for him. So, I mean, he's going to be fine for a few years. Speaking of uh, being fine, though, while the uh, the Maven spacecraft currently uh, is in a state of what I would describe as being fine, it won't be when we deploy the fairing, which is now. Uh, the fairings deployed and somehow broke one of the solar panels. And I didn't realize it at the time, but it also destroyed our magnetometer boom experiment. So... Oh no, I thought. I meant, I meant to be on the 10 year anniversary of Maven instead of celebrating the mission. I need to be dunking on NASA and telling them what they did wrong and how they could have done things better. And yet, we haven't even reached low carbon orbit and things have gone disastrously wrong. But then I thought, you know what? A, I can't be bothered to revert the flight and do it again. And B, maybe this is the perfect opportunity to show that I have a damaged spacecraft and yet we are going to be performing a vastly superior mission to the uh, the disappointment, I think, is the way you would describe the Maven. Uh, we're going to be uh, outdoing it. I really hope at some point it's become obvious that I am joking here. I know it's going to fall on deaf ears, at least to someone, and they're going to think that I'm actually being serious about NASA's pathetic Maven spacecraft being a failure. But, you know, I'm just putting it out there. This is all tongue-in-cheek, guys. If you are enjoying the tongue in the cheek, then do a little thumbs up down below. Helps me out with the old algorithm and all that stuff. And uh, yeah, there we are <laughs> performing. Well, we're about to perform the uh, the burn that's going to get us on a course to Duna. Now, I did mention just then, you know, guys, if you want to leave a little like down below, that really helps me out, which is a thing that YouTubers say a lot, right? The other thing that a lot of YouTubers say, and I am also guilty of this, I'm not, like, acting like I'm better or whatever, anything like that, but another thing a lot of YouTubers say is, oh, write a comment about this or comment below, I'll read the comments and all that. I'm just saying, like, if you want to, first of all, if you want to write a comment about something, about how much you love this mission and how you agree that the Maven spacecraft 10 years on, we can we can agree it was awful and a failure in every way. If you want to write a comment about that, then you feel free to do so. But you might not see many sort of interactions from me in the comment section below, like replying and hearting stuff. I will read the comments and stuff when I can, but at this very moment, like well, when the video goes live, so kind of today and tomorrow for you guys, so Saturday and Sunday, I guess, um, I'm, I'm actually competing in that KSP esports event that I mentioned. Me and Beardy Penguin, we formed a team, the Beardy Brits, and we're going to be competing. It's like a 24-hour endurance event, and I have to publish this video at some point during that event. So maybe I'll just, like, sneak off to the, to the toilet or something and just publish this on my phone so and then I'll have to get right back to it so I don't know how much like if we're really hyper concentrating and trying to win this competition you know I might not be that active in the comments does that make sense I don't know anyway I kind of talked over well I didn't talk about what was on the screen but basically we have used the Centaur upper stage to get us an encounter with Duna from low curb in orbit we then detached that Centaur lower stage and uh, now we're performing our course correction burn using the Maven's engines. Now, if anyone wants to criticize me, by the way, saying, oh, you know, you got a lot of mileage out of that just two-stage rocket. You know, NASA wouldn't have been able to get that kind of, you know, change in velocity from just the uh, Atlas lower stage and center upper stage. I would disagree and say, you know, well, that's, that's, not, that's not a me problem. That sounds like a NASA problem. If they don't know how to fly rockets efficiently, I don't see why I should, you know, handicap myself to uh, make up for the fact that NASA and the Maven spacecraft are um, are just not very good at this whole space thing, to be honest. In fact, I would like to go back to talking about the esports event and uh, kind of how this video came about. So I know I've said, guys, that like for Kerbal Space Program 1, I'm going to be doing lots more modded playthroughs and like showcasing mods and stuff. And yet here we are. Firstly, I've done two KSP2 videos, even though I said I was going to go more towards KSP1. Well, my last two KSP videos were in KSP2. And now we're back to KSP1. Oh, but it, it's stock again. Well, the reason for this is that I was planning to make a modded video today. It was showcasing... Oh, gosh, I forgot the name. It's like the inflatable 
mod <laughs> where you could like uh, deploy inflatable bases and it's like camping. It was really cool. I had a really great idea for that. And I'm still going to showcase that mod because I love it. But it's quite a big mod and I was a bit overwhelmed and I was trying to like do a mission with it that looked good. And I realized I probably wouldn't have time to make a video that I was happy with and also make a video that could really do that mod justice. It would take a while to make. And I really, this week, I only have one day to make a video because I'm at work this week. And then on Wednesday, so I'm recording this video on Monday, the 13th of November. Uh, tomorrow, I'm at my real job all day, so I probably won't have much time to make a video then. And then Wednesday, we're going to Paris. Like, well, so I live in a place called Plymouth in the UK, which is like in, it's miles away from anywhere. So we have to go to London to go to Paris. We're getting the Eurostar, which for those who don't know, it's a train that connects London to Paris and a few other European destinations as well. Uh, but to get from Plymouth to London, that's like a four and a half hour train ride. So we're just going to make, th to make things easier. We're going to just go to London on Wednesday and then stay the night in a cheap hotel in London. And then on Thursday, we'll get the Eurostar to Paris. And then we're doing lots of space conny stuff. Like it's not just an esports event. It's like a huge, big space event. So if anyone's going to space con, look out for me and I guess Beardy Penguin as well. You know, we're going to have a... We're going to hang out, have a little chill session and all that. Um, but yeah, that, that's my week basically coming up. So I don't have much. I have today. I had today to make a video basically. So I made space this week at the weekend. Knowing I don't have to make kind of minor corrections when I published it today. <laughs> and then I only had like then, I guess, half to three quarters of a day to make a KSP video. I started making my modded video and I was like, you know what? I haven't got time. So I'm going to do this instead. And here we are touching down on the surface of Duna. Uh, somewhat anticlimactic because I've got that bug again where the engines are no longer making any sound. I think it's to do with better time warp. Uh, I could have restarted the game, but I guess I didn't because of the aforementioned time restrictions that I was working to. But hey, look at that. Jebediah is now on EVA and he can start analyzing Duna's atmosphere. So as you can see, I've got a variety of science experiments and we have deployable tech as well. I mentioned right at the beginning of this video that I'm going to be deploying uh, lots of deployable science. Uh, among the things that you can deploy is a weather station, which is perfect for analyzing the atmosphere of Juna. Uh, I was fanning around for a little bit, so I'm going to crossfade uh, to a point further on in time where we actually started uh, unpacking stuff. So first of all, this light. All of the lights I find in KSP uh, 1 are a bit difficult to deploy, like they always fall over. Which is another thing I really liked in the, uh, oh, I probably should just actually look at what this mod is called, because I've got to keep on uh, mentioning it, aren't I? And I'm not going to, I'm not going to remember the name, and I don't think that's really fair. Uh, Pathfinder, I just googled it, uh, the Pathfinder mod. Anyway, in that Pathfinder mod, which includes lots of deployable things, is a light, and the light, it anchors itself to the ground, and it's a big tall lamppost that telescopically extends. It's great, one of my favourite things I like about that mod, in fact. So, yes, that's going to be the next I, I think, I don't know. That's going to be the next modded KSP1 video. Or I might make a video of, well, I, I'm planning to make a video of the esports event that we do. I'm bringing my capture card over to France with me. So, you know, uh, that might be the next one. Oh, I don't know what the sketch, I don't know what the future holds, basically. It's all, it's all very exciting. Uh, but here, look at this. We've, uh, we've deployed all of the deployable things that needed to be deployed. And there's the little weather station there. You can see it spinning around that little... Uh, like a uh, wind turbine thing that looks like a four spoons. I, d I guess that has a name, but I just I don't ca I've already done my fair share of googling, right? I had to find out what that mod was called that I downloaded earlier. I've done I've, I've already gone beyond the what I think is the call of duty really when it comes to uh, you know making making KSP videos and putting them on the internet for people to watch on YouTube now there is one more science experiment that we need to do, and that is, of course, the very, very scientific science experiment that is uh, hitting a golf ball into the air. But we are going to use this. We're going to see how the trajectory of the ball, what how it is uh, on Juna, and compare that to Jebediah's swing back on Kerbin. We're going to hit it that way along what is roughly the 90 degree vector then we're going to go ahead and hit another golf ball along approximately the 270 degree vector it's not perfect on the level but it's like basically one direction then the other direction so we can see if the atmosphere is like if there's wind blowing will the ball go further or not get as far when we hit it this way all rather exciting and there it goes Jebediah does a nice beautiful stroke little swing and a little wave and uh 
Well, there we are. We've earned, we've earned 200 science from that little experiment right there. Uh, but that's actually pretty much all of the th all of the things that Jebediah needs to do on the surface of Juno. So I'm gonna just put his uh well I oh yeah I, I wasn't quite sure what happened here. I thought I used those experiments, but then they were still in Jebediah's inventory. Did I not use them correctly? Or was that a bug? I don't know. Not sure. Anyway, doesn't matter. We are now on our well. We're planning to get back to Juno orbit. So I'm gonna wait for a pointed time where I think the mothership is in a good spot. Spoiler alert: it, it wasn't, but. It's all right. We work with it. It's fine. Then we can begin our ascent. And I actually really like how this Duna lander came out. It's quite cute, isn't it? It's a, it's a nice little compact size. And it's, it is quite, it was quite fun kind of building a craft to the restrictions of the 2.5 meter, you know, box that uh, the, the, the Maven spacecraft was. So if you want to like challenge yourself or, you know, um, give yourself some sort of arbitrary restriction. I mean, just ask ChatGPT to design a mission for you. That's always quite fun. But otherwise, maybe something like this. Maybe I could do a community thing. What can you build in a 2.5 by 2.5 by 2.5 meter panel box? Uh, put it on uh, the social media. Whoosh, right on the bottom right. Tweet it at me or exit at me or whatever it's called these days and sub my subreddit all that good stuff. Anyway, I want to just uh, revisit, well, I kind of, I kind of uh, recover a topic that I abandoned earlier. <laughs> and that was how this video came to be about. So I already mentioned why I had to make it. You know, I just didn't have time to make anything kind of more grandiose. But also, you know, when I, when I realized, oh, I have to pull the plug on this idea of showcasing the Pathfinder mod this week, what do I do? And I just sat there thinking, like, I can't think of a video. I'm just, I'm drawing a blank here. I've been doing this for like eight years, if you can believe it. So it's kind of now hard for me to think of original ideas. So I hit up Wikipedia. I literally just typed in on Google, uh, November the 18th. And if you type in a date uh, on Google and there'll be a Wikipedia page that comes up with every notable thing that happened on November the 18th. And I just scroll down, see if there's any kind of historic anniversary or anything. Fun fact, this is how I used to make the history segments in uh, Space This Week. I just used to Google the day, uh, the, uh, well, I used to Google the day of every day of a given week and just find any kind of space-related anniversary on the Wikipedia page and then wrote the script around that. And there was very little in the way of interesting things to do on November the 18th until I scrolled down far enough to get to 2013 where there it was. NASA launched the MAVEN spacecraft to Mars and I was like, right! I think I'm just going to Google Maven spacecraft and let me tell you guys, I Googled it and I was appalled by just how terribly mediocre it was as we've already established. I was like, well, they could have put an astronaut in there among a great, uh, they could have brought a golf club with them to the surface, they could have hit the golf ball, there's so much they could have done and they waste, they squandered it on a pathetic measly satellite. So um, that, that, was, that's the, uh, that was the origin story for today's video. And I hope it's been an enjoyable video as the mission is kind of like approaching its end. We are now very, very close to the Mothership Maven spacecraft. I actually delayed the docking a little bit so that we could rendezvous on the light side of the planet rather than in shadow on the dark side. So yeah, I could have got my encounter a little bit sooner, but here we're now docking in the, uh, in the light of day. So you can actually see what's going on because I say this a lot, but YouTube really does uh, ruin videos when the video is dark, like the uh, the compression that YouTube uses doesn't really make the bode well for dark videos. Like YouTube's compression makes videos a lot darker. Like when I watch my videos before I put them on YouTube, so I just watch it after it's rendered on my, you know, in VLC player, it always looks a little bit too bright. But then when I watch it on YouTube, it looks just right, at least to my eye. I know some people don't like the color correction I do on my videos, but I, I like it. And then my videos, so... You know, that's you make your own. <laughs> uh, don't I don't I don't want any competition here. I want to, I want to be a monopoly. But here we are doing some something of the lounge lazy method of docking, uh, where we have both ships target each other. But I only have a very kind of low tech probe core on the Maven mothership, so I kind of have to manually hold the target, and then Jebediah can hold target himself in the lander. And yeah, it's a very it's a bit of a squeeze. But they do. It does indeed fit and we can all dock together. Although I did forget to recover the science from the Maven spacecraft's instruments. I then just remembered and I was like, oh, we need to get Jeb on EVA, but of course he can't because there's no space. So, uh, you know what? We've got data from the surface and I did some science experiments during our initial descent through Juno's upper atmosphere. So to be honest, I'm satisfied with the amount of science we've gathered here. We don't need to re recover that data. And in fact, we will have an opportunity later on to recover at least 
some of the science data from the Maven Mothership spacecraft, but I'll uh, keep that to myself in terms of just exactly what I mean by that. Anyway, before we set off back to Kerbin, I just wanted to uh, enable crossfeed on the docking port because I don't need the lander to have any fuel in it anymore, so we can make sure the Maven spacecraft is pulling not only from its own fuel tanks, but also using the excess fuel from the lander. We're also time warping to a Juna transfer window again. Well, I guess I should say a Kerbin transfer window from Juna, which is the same as a Kerbin to Juna transfer window, uh, because we don't have that much Delta V. As you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, we only have... 41 meters per second of delta V, which is not enough, but also that number is wrong. The actual delta V total that we have is about 1,285, my uh, Vegas Pro preview is a bit blurry, but about 1,300 meters per second. It's the delta V current total thing uh, at the top left of the screen. It's not a perfect representation because it's kind of taking into account different things like the e different engines on the ship, so it might not be perfect, but that's near enough what we have. So. I don't worry. That's why you know we we're not going to use cheats or anything to get back home. If that was the uh, if that was a concern that any of you had, the reason why there's a discrepancy with the uh, the blue delta V readout and the uh, I guess the green yellow delta V readout at the top is because obviously the numbers at the top are a mod. They're Kerbal Engineer Redux. They're not part of the stock game. And Kerbal Engineer Redux, I guess, is uh, calculating things a bit better than the stock game delta V calculator is doing. Anyway, we have now done our burn. It's going to get us to Kerbin's sphere of influence. As you can see, it didn't perfectly align with what the maneuver node tool predicted. So we will have to do a course correction burn. But as you can see, we are pretty close to the blue planet, so it's not going to be a very expensive maneuver at all. And then we can get to the uh, the really scary part of this mission, because you may have noticed that we don't have a Kerbin lander here, right? You know, we have the Maven spacecraft, which does not have a heat shield or parachutes, and we have the Juno lander, which has parachutes, but no heat shield. And the lander can, being used there, is very, very weak. It's got a very low crash tolerance and it overheats very, very easily. So it's gonna be a bit sketchy. My plan was like, you know, we're coming from Juna. Our velocity relative to Kerbin is not gonna be that high. I reckon that the panels of the Maven spacecraft should be able to withstand the uh, the heating of re-entry. And then once we've decelerated to safe speeds, we will then open up the lander again. We'll open up the, Ma the Maven, I should say, and uh, just uh, undock the lander. And then use our Duna landing parachutes to land on Kerbin. Uh, so yeah, all in all kind of sketchy. <laughs> uh, but, uh, well, I'm looking forward to you showing you guys uh, later in the video. <laughs> I trailed, I trailed off a bit there, didn't I, towards the end. But look at that, we've done our course correction burn. We've got a nice low Kerbin periapsis. I briefly considered doing a retrograde burn to capture around Kerbin, but I thought, you know what? We have enough fuel to capture around Kerbin, but let's just, just let this video is already like over 20 minutes long. Let's just go straight into the atmosphere and hope for the best. Of course, right now, our periapsis is above the, uh, the so-called Kármán line, I know Kármán line is specific to Earth, but, the, you know, the Kerman line, uh, it's above that. We can do a radial inburn once we're in Kerbin's sphere of influence to uh, lower it into the atmosphere. And in fact, uh, whilst I was explaining all of that, we, we just did that. So our apoapsis is 45.5 uh, kilometers above sea level. So it's fairly high, but hopefully low enough. Well, hopefully it's high enough so we don't hit the atmosphere too fast and explode, but also low enough that we encounter sufficient atmospheric drag to not only capture around Kerbin, but also, you know, uh, we don't go back into space, basically. I think Jebediah Kerman, he's probably bored of those seven DVD rips that I uh, put on his iPad and he wants to just go home. So let's just try and get home as quickly as possible. <laughs> and here we go. We are entering the atmosphere. Now, I did decide to open up the hatch and expose the lander to kind of, well, not the heat of re-entry, but also just opening the door. So in case we need to make a quick evacuation, we could just eject the lander and get away from the exploding spacecraft. I bound undocking and the deployment of the parachutes to a single action group. So we can just hit that button and it all just goes all at once. I've got to like zoom in and try and right click parts while spinning during re-entry. But as it turned out, it was all fine. As you can see, we are no longer 
we don't have an apoapsis anymore. No, we do. We don't have a periapsis anymore. So we are definitely going to be landing, and it looks like we're going to be landing in the grasslands. So now we're at safe speeds. We no longer have to worry about any of the heat of re-entry. We can hit the uh, the brakes action group, which is the action group that I, big brain move, decided to use for the separation of the docking ports and indeed the deployment of the parachutes, those red drogue chutes, of course, uh, deploying first, followed by the four main chutes. So yeah, this is kind of very overkill in terms of the number of parachutes needed to land on Kerbin. But of course, on Juna, we learnt, we've studied its atmosphere, right? Yeah? And we know it's got a much more tenuous atmosphere than Kerbin, so you kind of need a bit more parachutes to land on Juna than you would on Kerbin. Touching down nice, low speed, we're going to just try and bleed off speed at the very last minute with the engines, and I realise we've actually still got pretty good thrust to weight ratio. So I got a bit overzealous there with the landing. But then, you know what? I realised that I could actually you know, fly with the engines on Kerbin. And I noticed that some of the Maven has actually survived impact. I thought, well, you know what? we got to investigate this. Maybe we could learn more about not, you know what? Like, you know, the Maven spacecraft only researched Mars, right? We could use ours to research not just Juno's atmosphere, but also Kerbin's atmosphere. We can see how much survived during re-entry. Maybe this can, we can learn. Do you know what I mean? NASA, come on, NASA. I've done so much more in my mission than you ever did with your spacecraft. Take notes, take notes. Anyway, there's the uh, there's the uh, the wreckage down there. We're going to perform a second Kerbin landing with this lander. I did make sure to quick save before actually attempting this little maneuver. That would have been quite sad if I'd messed it up and Jebediah died this late on in the mission. There we are, touching down once again. Jebediah can disembark the spacecraft and oh wow can we can just go and have a little investigation of the uh of the maven oh yeah i made sure to take the data so i don't have to run back to the uh the, the capsule again before i recovered the vessel or i guess in this case we're only going to be recovering jebediah so here we are arriving at the uh the golden carcass and look at that i said remember we would be able to take some of the data there we are we managed to save the gravity scan taken of uh, Duna. Nothing else has really survived aside from structural pieces. But look at that, this uh, panel piece has actually become somewhat buried. In fact, the whole vehicle has become a little bit buried in the ground. I mean, that's just like a glitch, right? It's just clipping in, but isn't that cool? Anyway, here is the science that we earned. As you can see, my Maven has earned us 1,124 science, but is it actually any better than NASA's? Well, let's have a look at the Wikipedia page for the Maven. As you can see, the mission in total has earned NASA 478 science points, which I think we can all agree pales in comparison to the scientific findings of my mission. And with that, the video mission is over. I hope you enjoyed it. This was a tribute to the NASA Maven mission and jokes aside now, very great mission, very important mission. And uh, it's this whole video was basically a joke, right? I hope that's clear if it wasn't already. But it was all made possible thanks to the names on the screen on the left by Patreon supporters. Guys, I hope you enjoyed the ride and I'll see you in the next one.